A little bit out of time in case. No. Okay. Oh, I, I just keep checking, so I, I don't. I try to stay the time. So good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Luca Patriarca, and I I am a temporary researcher at Politecnico uh, di Milano, and I will uh, give two presentations. The first one is. Uh, on a study of strain localization in a polycrystalline medium in presence of a quasi static track. <coughs> so, this study aims to uh, provide some uh, preliminary insight into the uh, microstructural effects of uh, uh, loading of a cracked body, static loading of a cracked body. In particular, uh, I will show the preliminary results of the simulation and of the experiments. Now, as I said, uh, I, so, uh, as I said, uh, the, so this work uh, basically is a part of, I mean, this work is part of the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Dr. Pietro Lucarelli. He uh, mainly worked on the crystal plasticity framework that I was going to present. So in case you uh, I can answer some of these questions about the simulations. Uh, you can, uh, I write this in you can, in case, ask some uh, specific questions to him. I'm more involved in the experimental part of this work uh, with the digital image correlation, and our uh, professor that followed us in this activity is uh, Professor Stefano uh, Foletti. Now, as I said, uh, So, as I said, uh, we know that uh, traditional fractal mechanics approaches are based on continuum mechanics. So, basically, uh, when we think about uh, uh, plasticity uh, in front of a crack tip, we always think uh, as uh, uh, a material that is uh, homogeneous. So, if we think uh, with the uh, classical uh, approaches. But uh, if we can take a close look at the crack tip, we know that uh, uh, there arise some uh, local effects uh, due to the different orientation of the grains. And uh, depending on these uh, microstructural effects, also the crack tip damage can uh, evolve uh, differently, depending on the microstructure that uh, the crack tip encounters in front of, I mean, depending on the uh, microstructural uh, grain orientations. So, this, uh, uh, this work. Uh, as I said, aims to, first of all, to try to simulate uh, with crystal plasticity this uh, uh, microstructural effect and also we are trying to compare with uh, uh, experimental evidence uh, by using uh, local uh, subgrain digital image uh, correlation strain fields. So I will just give a brief overview of uh, the crystal plasticity code that we are using. As I said, I will go uh, quickly just to make you, uh, uh, let me say, comfortable with the concept that we are using. Um, crystal plasticity is based on the multi multiplicative decomposition of the deformation gradient. And basically, this deformation gradient is seen as a multiplication of uh, an elastic deformation gradient and a plastic deformation gradient. By using this uh, uh, tensor, we uh, can define the velocity gradient tensor L, and in particular, if we uh, take a close look at the plastic component of this uh, velocity gradient, we can see that uh, uh, here in this expression we see the dependence of this uh, velocity gradient with the microstructure. So basically we have uh, a, a summation over the slip systems of the crystal lattice that we are investigating. In our case, I'll show later, it is a face-centered cubic uh, Sector. So, of course, we know the potential slip system. We know the BS, the slip direction vector, and the normal to the slip plane. So, this is something that we know from theory. What we don't know for this specific material is uh, this uh, uh, gamma prime S. So, the slip rate on the, uh, each slip system. And in order to predict this uh, slip rate, we need uh, a model. Now, uh, again, uh, quickly, uh, in order to define this uh, 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 slip rate, we uh, use this uh, power law uh, expression in which we have a reference 
shear rate uh, the resolved shear stress on the slip, specific slip plane which is, uh, uh, I mark it with a green because it's an output of uh, our analysis so with crystal plasticity we can calculate the stresses inside each grain and along uh, the specific uh, slip system and uh, what is uh, the key point of this model is to be able to predict uh, the slip system strength so we need a model to account uh, to be able to predict what is the critical stress in order to activate a specific slip system into a single grain. Now, in order to uh, predict this slip system strength, there are different uh, uh, models in literature. Some are uh, basically they are classified in, in these two categories. One. Uh, is the phenomenological constant models <coughs> and the other one are more complex because they are more physically oriented so they, they are called physically based the constant models and they uh, account for microstructural effects so basically uh, as he is written here they are based on uh, the fact that uh, these locations need to overcome obstacles in order to uh, to produce plasticity at the micro scale. Now, very quickly, this is our uh, parameter that we need to estimate for our material. And uh, uh, as a general statement, uh, the slip system strength depends on the temperature. So, typically, for uh, I mean, as a general statement for metallic alloys, we know that if we increase the temperature, the slip system strength goes down, so the heel stress goes down as well. And uh, this slip system strength depends also on the uh, plastic strain rate. Now, this is the model. Again, I don't want to enter too much, too much in details, uh, also because honestly, I'm not that much an expert on this. We can just uh, uh, see how is uh, uh, composed of this model. As I said, uh, the slip system strength can be uh, decomposed in three components. One is constant, and the other two depends account, let me say, for yielding and uh, the set the third one for the hardening. In this way we can uh, describe uh, the hardening behavior of uh, the material. In addition, the single grain is elastically anisotropic, so we need to account uh, for this elastic anisotropy, and we do this uh, knowing that uh, if we have uh, a cubic material, we can relate the elastic uh, matrix by, let me say, evaluating the, these C11, C12 and C14 constants from the isotropic elastic constants. So knowing these uh, isotropic elastic <coughs> constants, the classical Young modulus, loss ratio, and uh, shear um, elastic modulus, we can estimate the anisotropic uh, <coughs> matri elastic matrix. Again, this is this holds only for cubic mati uh, materials, cubic crystal lattices. Now, let's uh, just give uh, many uh, little bit uh, some details on this model. We have uh, many, I mean, the model is uh, complex, so in, it accounts for different, uh, it requires different uh, parameters to be estimated. In particular, there are some of these parameters with with, that are very, very difficult to estimate uh, experimentally. So, uh, typically, we require advanced the simulations to be for these parameters to be calculated. And in fact, we uh, obtained these uh, uh, material parameters from literature. There are some studies that present these uh, uh, parameters. For the other parameters, we uh, need to calculate from our specific material. So before running the simulation, we need to calculate these uh, uh, red parameters that can only be obtained by fitting experimental results. So in the first, uh, let me say, part of the, uh, this work, uh, the aim is to set, to uh, calculate these parameters for the crystal plasticity model. How we do this? Uh, we start, of course, from the uh, knowledge of the, the material that we are investigating is uh, Ames, a nickel-based alloy, 
which is uh, typically used for high temperature application because it has good corrosion properties, oxidation properties, and uh, crack properties. This material has a face centered cubic uh, uh, crystal structure. So, as I said before, we know all the potential slip system for this microstructure. So, initially, we uh, cut one, I mean, more than one, of course, but here, uh, one small dog bone. Uh, uh, sample for a simple tensile experiment because we need, uh, as I said, to calculate the uh, material properties of this object. So how we uh, prepare this, uh, this sample? We basically uh, polished uh, the one surface to reach the quality for ADSD measurements and we marked a specific area with uh, decals, indentation markers. Uh, so we mark a specific area of this sample the dimension uh, is uh, something, uh, it accounts for different uh, requirements, this dimension of the area. First of all, we need uh, some statistical, uh, how can I say, we need uh, a relatively large number of grains, but not too much because later we also have to uh, try to measure with digital image correlation uh, the strengths. So it's a kind of uh, the choice of this uh, dimension, of this. Uh, uh, area is a compromise between these two things. So again, we mark this area and we perform an EBSD calculation of the grain orientation of this area before the experiment. Second step is to use, uh, we are using this uh, a small load frame which can go to up to 5 kN of load in order to produce a simple stress strain curve. Because of we placed uh, these markers, we can locate uh, these markers uh, here. One, two, three, and uh, these three. We can locate the markers into the EBSD scan. We prepare this uh, surface also for digital image correlation measurements. And because of we have these markers, we can also reconstruct uh, overlap EBSD and uh, the strain field. Uh, I think we will talk uh, a lot during this uh, workshop of, the, of digital image correlation, so I skip the theoretical part of digital image correlation. Again, we have this sample that we haven't yet tested. We perform a simple stress strain curve and we can get uh, the local uh, strain field overlapped with the uh, grain boundaries obtained by EBSD. The correlation is performed uh, at the end of the experiment. So this strain field is the residual strain field. Only, basically, plastic deformation uh, are shown in this uh, uh, plot. Now, uh, how we constructed the, the model for crystal plasticity? We uh, took the EBSD map and we construct the uh, crystal plasticity model considering the orientation of the grain. Now, we have a fundamental assumption to do in this case, that uh, the grains that we see here are, is a two-dimensional information. So what we did with the crystal plasticity is to extrude this two-dimensional information. And uh, of course uh, this is uh, an approximation. So we we'll see that locally the strains uh, do not match too much, but as I said, this is reasonable because of we are using uh, an extrapolated information. So uh, we perform the simulation with crystal plasticity by using this model, which is based on the EBSD scan of the, our uh, uh, sample. And by a trial and error uh, procedure, we estimated the unknown material parameters until, uh, I mean, until my colleague got a good description of the tensile uh, stress uh, strain behavior. Now, looking for correspondence of uh, the local strains between experiment and uh, simulation, as I said, is a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. because uh, so uh, there is not a scale, but this, this is 100 microns. You know, that after 100 microns in the thickness, the microstructure changes completely, mm -hmm. and this is not accounted in the simulation. So it's very really difficult to precisely locate all the local strains, but at the end, we have some, uh, you can see some correspondence. We, uh, we plot the histogram of these uh, local strains for the simulation and for the 
digital image correlation, and we see that at least the trend of the local strains is well captured by the, uh, by the simulation. Now, we, we set the model. Let's move uh, to something more probably interesting for us, a preliminary study of a quasi-static crack. Uh, now, the idea is to, uh, to use the crystal plasticity to uh, model uh, the crack tip strain field. So we prepared, uh, we machined this sample with this shape, is a single edge notched sample with um, depth of 0.5 millimeters. And uh, now the problem is that, uh, well, we want to create a crack but without too much plasticity because we don't want that this pre cracking influences too much uh, the uh, <coughs> the quasi-static uh, monitoring, monitoring loading that we will do later. So, in order to uh, limit the plasticity intention, we decided to uh, perform a... Uh, it's not written here... to perform a compression pre-cracking uh, uh, procedure. We located a crack in, the, in this part, in, this, uh, in front of the notch by compression pre-cracking technique and that uh, is visible here. Now, you cannot see, but there is also a small secondary crack here that at, at, at the beginning we didn't notice. So, we performed the two loading steps. The, the first one at 10 megapascal uh, square root of meter and the second one to 20 megapascal square root of meter. And uh, we can, uh, we could capture with digital image correlation the receiver strain field after these two uh, load steps. Now, you may ask why we calculate only the residual strain field. Because uh, for, for now, our experimental setup does not enable to reach subgrain strain resolution in situ, so real time. For now, we are only using high resolution microscopy, but we can do this only out of the load frame. So the AC works pretty well, but we can only estimate uh, uh, residual strains. But anyway, the, uh, the main information that we have from this experiment is that we know the active grains uh, in front of the crack tip. And uh, um, another limit of this experiment is that uh, we also have for sure the effect of the notch. But this is not that important because we are trying to see if uh, the case of plasticity code is able to predict uh, this uh, strain localization due to both the notch and uh, the crack. How we constructed this uh, model? So my colleague uh, worked uh, in this case in this way. First of all, we started always from the information from the experiment, so the EBSD map in front uh, of uh, the notch region. Our crack is located around here. This is the tip of the notch. And clearly, we cannot capture all the sample, the microstructure of the sample. First of all, because it's useful. Second, because it's very time consuming in terms of uh, uh, computational time. So what we did, uh, we uh, modeled precisely the microstructure in front of the notch for this, uh, I think is one millimeter. So this is one millimeter by one. And uh, uh, for the rest of the model, we consider the uh, material has isotropic and only elastic. Because, of course, uh, the localization of space will be in the area of the notch. All the other part of the, uh, the sample will be elastically. So I think this is a good uh, uh, approximation of uh, the simulation. And here is uh, uh, the simulation compared to the experiment with only one uh, crack, we noticed that after the experiment there is a small secondary crack here so we noticed that there was a secondary crack only after the AC experiment so as a second step we also modeled the presence of this uh, sec small secondary uh, crack now again uh, for sure crystal plasticity is able to capture the microscopic area involved in the, uh, I mean, which shows the uh, plastically deformed grains. And there are also some uh, 
uh, grains that show the same uh, localization. But again, I want to, uh, to emphasize the fact that uh, this is a two-dimensional, basically two-dimensional simulation. So we take a two-dimensional uh, EBSD scan and we extrude in order to construct our model. And this is a, a big, uh, a big, uh, how can I say, limitation in order to have uh, a one-to-one -one grain by grain comparison. So, uh, at least uh, for now, we were we were, we were not expecting so nice results. But still, I think that uh, it's uh, a, a good result uh, for this uh, simulation. And uh, why it's uh, important to set properly this simulation? Because now, with crystal plasticity, uh, first of all, we have an information that, uh, with the experiment, we cannot have, which is uh, also the stress field at the grain level. But I'm not showing because we haven't yet analyzed it. Honestly. So this this work is like this is last part is the last one. So we are still working on it. But secondary, another very important thing is that we can correlate these localizations with uh, the orientation of the grains. So, in this case, for example, uh, we analyzed the grains involved in the deformation in front of the crack tip for this uh, uh, dashed area. And what we, what we saw is that uh, the, grain, the act, let's call the active grains, so the grains that show very high local deformations, the orientation of this grain is, does not follow a specific uh, texture. But uh, the activation of the grains is more governed by the, uh, let me say, by the fact that we have a specific uh, stress distribution due to the presence of the crack. And this is, let me say, uh, the uh, results that we got uh, in, as a preliminary analysis for this uh, experiment. Now, in the last two minutes, I just want to uh, show you the improvements that we are trying to, to make. So basically the remarks that uh, for this first part of the work uh, are the ones that I already discussed, discussed during the presentation. We have a limitation due to the fact that uh, uh, the uh, crystal plasticity simulation is, is uh, obtained from a two-dimensional extrapolated EBSD scan. And uh, the, the main point is that, as I said, is that with crystal plasticity we can study, so if we can find uh, the right parameters, as we did for now, you later you can study the local stress field and also the stress, the strain distribution along the single grain, which uh, is a very important information also uh, later to verify models that account for uh, closure eff effects and so on. Now I just want to spend, as I said, one or two minutes more uh, for the, uh, the developments that we are uh, now doing on these uh, simulations and experiments. <coughs> uh, basically, this is the, uh, as I said, the tensile <coughs> experiment, the tensile experiment that we performed on this material. And uh, since we want to propagate this crack on this sample, and we want to start to work on uh, uh, the observation of the development of plasticity and the crack closure, we need uh, to see if our model is able also to capture ratcheting because of uh, uh, this phenomena will be uh, responsible of the development of plasticity <coughs> and crack closure effects. So the idea was to obtain, uh, to machine another sample as uh, the one that we used for the side sample and uh, to perform a ratcheting test in this uh, region of the stresses. So what we did, uh, we we, as I said, we machined another sample and we tested this sample between 0 and 450 uh, megapascal. So we reached this point and we cycled for uh, 10 cycles. And this is the experimental microscopic stress behavior. So you see we have a little bit of yielding after the first cycle. And after 10 cycles we have some accumulation of plasticity on this sample. In particular, after 10 cycles, we accumulated 0.1%. And uh, here is just a comparison between the monotonic and the, the ratcheting test. Experimentally, with digital image correlation, we could see uh, this evidence. So this is the strain map for this uh, sample. 
after the first cycle, and this is after 10 cycles. Uh, the, nice, the nice evidence that we got with digital image correlation is that uh, the strain that accumulates over the first cycle are still uh, keep increasing uh, after 10 cycles. And uh, no evidence of uh, other drains activation after 10 cycles uh, uh, is uh, found. What means this? It means that uh, after the first cycle we already know what are the drains that will accumulate most of the uh, deformation and probably we, we can also predict what are the veins that will show mm. the correct nucleation. Again, we constructed uh, the uh, model based on the EBSD scan of this area and we simulated uh, with the parameters that we got from the monotonic, uh, the initial monotonic tensile stress and we could uh, get a nice correspondence of the local strains but most important, we could uh, predict uh, very well the ratcheting uh, uh, behavior of uh, this alloy. On the macro scale, uh, the simulation is giving us a very nice uh, uh, prediction. So, this uh, is, uh, as I said, the next step that uh, we wish. And now, the uh, aim is to try to simulate uh, a propagation with the, the development of uh, the Kirk closure phenomenon. So thanks for the attention.